Hi, and welcome to this edition of One on One. I'm Howie Rose, and we're joined today by, among many other things, one of only two people to hit a postseason home run off of the great Mariano Rivera. He did it in the World Series in Game 2 in 2000 at Yankee Stadium. It is great to see Jay Payton back in New York. How you doing, Jay? Doing good. Thanks for having me, Howie. Uh, you like being remembered as the last guy to hit a postseason home run off of Mariano because there was a whole lot more to your career, of course. Oh, I, I don't mind at all. It's better to remember for something like that. So I, I, that's probably my highlight of my career for sure and make me a trivia question someday. Do people bring that up to you when they meet you? Do, the, do their memories match yours in some ways? Um, some of them do. Sometimes when it's being brought up on TV, or something some of my friends will call me up and be like hey was that that you hit the home run? I'm like yes that was that was one of my great and shiny moments so that was that was me so it's pretty funny to mess around with my friends with it well before jay even became a new york med he was part of a great collegiate team at georgia tech featuring among others nomar garcia para and jason veritek and not comparing collegiate teams to major league teams necessarily, but pound for pound, if you will. Was that a good, as good a team as you ever played for? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. We, we had a solid team. One through nine guys could hit. We had some pretty good pitch, and that was probably a little bit of our weakness, which is why we lost to OU in the championship game in the College World Series. But, I mean, we averaged about 9.8 runs a game, I think, and I got to back clean up. So those two guys had probably 600 on base percentages. So I always had a couple guys on base every time I came up. Well, the fact that Jay talks about batting cleanup, should not be met with raised eyebrows because when he was drafted in the first round in 1994, the expectation was that the Mets had themselves a real solid major league hitter who would spend a long time in New York. But before you got here, you had some impossible hurdles to overcome. Can you outline all the injuries you had before you finally made it to New York? Yeah, and that was the tough part. I probably didn't end up getting the kind of career I was projected to out of college, but I had, uh, had a Tommy John surgery, kind of got we tried to get back a little quicker since I wasn't a pitcher, didn't have a lot of history with outfielders having it. Ended up not healing well, didn't play a whole lot one season, and then went into spring training the next season, blew my elbow out again, had to have another Tommy John surgery. I had a little scope in there as well, and then I ended up hurting my left shoulder because I was trying to protect my elbow, trying to come back, so I had to have a surgery on my left shoulder. So, yeah, I went through, went through the ringer a little bit before I ever got to the big leagues. And where along the line before you did make it in? It was 98, I believe, right, when you came got up? Got called late. up in 98. Yep. Yeah, so between 94 and 98, was there ever a time you thought, I got to do something else with my life. I can't deal with all these injuries. Um, probably when I, right before I had my second Tommy John, because the first one I had, it was more of a pain. It kind of hurt, and just go have the surgery, rehab, come back. But when I blew it out the second time, I had a lot of pain, and I, you know, the doctor even told me he's like, "Hey, you might not, might not ever play again, but we can do another Tommy John surgery and kind of see how it goes." So that's probably the low point in my life where I felt like I might not get a chance to to play again. How'd you overcome that? Not only the physical part of it, but the mental part that you allude to. Um, I mean, I come from, you know, I got great parents, good families, you know, the support and everything. Did my rehab, they were there for me, you know, no matter what happened, whether I could get back and play, not get back and play. So, you know, having that in my family behind me was, it made it easier for me to just go out and work. You know, I, I didn't have to do anything else. I had to put my rehab in and just put in a lot of hard work and try to get back. Were your expectations for your own career forced to change by the time you got to the big leagues because of the injuries or did you figure okay I've got a clean bill of health now I'm gonna be what everybody thinks I'm supposed to be um, I, don't think, I don't think your expectations change but reality the fact of the matter is I spent two and a half of the last four years more on a DL and trying to rehab yeah. than I did actually plan so when you're playing at that level you're just you're gonna lose some things and you know, you still think that you can do everything, and I was on, the, for me, I was on the fast track to get to the big leagues, and then, you know, you spend the next four years rehabbing, so I still had the expectation to go out and just basically be the best player I could be, whatever that was. So you get to the Mets in 1998, and they're in the midst of a, a race for a, a wild card spot, and you're an impressionable kid, not that far out of Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. Who among the veterans that the Mets had might have mentored you and taken you under their wing? Um, actually, I think at that time, I remember Tony Phillips was around. I remember mm -hmm. talking to, to talking to Tony a good bit, you know, and just because, you know, he had his ups and downs throughout his career and just, you know, trying to guide me and just give me some direction. I think Bobby did put me into pinch run. I think I remember going from first to third, I think, trying to go to first to third on Andrew Jones, and I got hosed at third <laughs> by about three or four steps and you know that was one of those games like I say Tony came up and said hey man don't worry about it. it's a tough situation you're a young guy just learn from it and kind of kind of move on because it was a situation where I obviously should have stopped at second and not try to go first to third on that play. When you get back to the dugout that somebody say oh yeah you know we forgot to tell you about the arm on Andrew yeah. Jones. <laughs> yep that, that that was the thing with him and the, the other thing that's funny when you talk about that was guys tell me the first time I got on base against Andy Pettit 
just in a regular game, they're like, Andy will pick you off. And I'm like, well, everybody's told me he's going to pick me off, so he's not going to pick me off. Of course, I'm looking for the ball to go home. He throws behind me, picks me off. So <laughs> even if you're told about it, sometimes it don't work out. He had about as good a pickoff oh, move yeah. as there's ever been. Yeah. What, 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 the, there's a borderline there yeah. between a balk move and a good pickoff move. Mm -hmm. For a young player like yourself, did you get kind of caught on those crosshairs and that fine line between the two of them? Yeah, definitely. I mean, he, he had probably the best left-handed move of all time going to first base, and he he probably balked or came close to balking every single time he'd done it. But, you know, guys get a, a reputation, and they're just not going to call that on him, and he picked off a ton of guys because of it. Well, we'll talk about the World Series in a moment and the tremendously emotional game the year afterwards after 9-11. But just as an overview, do you have a favorite game that you played in with the Mets, regular uh, season game? Favorite game? Um, in the regular season, it's kind of hard to say. I will say I, another thing I remember that's funny is I probably went like oh for my first eight with bases loaded as, as a rookie. And uh, one of the trainers, he's like, hey, you need to switch your, your song up, you know, when you go up with bases loaded. So I told them to pick something. And I remember I came up and they played, I, she thinks my tractor's sexy or something like that. <laughs> and I hit a grand slam. So I was like, all right, that was my first hit with the bases loaded. I'm like, you guys can always pick out my my uh, walk-up song when I got the bases loaded. So I, that, for whatever reason, that one kind of sticks with me a little bit. You play that every morning when you get up now? No, not anymore. No? You let <laughs> no. go of that? Yeah, it's gone. Uh, let's, let's talk about that postseason run in 2000 because, you know, you did get into the postseason in 1999, and Todd Pratt had, had the game-winning home run against Arizona, and then you have this great series against Atlanta. How much did the experience of 99 help you en route to the World Series in 2000? I think that's that's kind of what you always build up to. You, you have a young team, you got guys getting experience, and you know you have close games. That's what I was telling somebody the other day. You lose a lot of games by a run or whatever one year, and then the next year you kind of figure out how to win some of those, and then maybe the next year you, you win a lot more. So you just you build off of that experience that you get, and you try to take it with you. You learn from your mistakes and, and just continue to improve. So I think just getting to that situation, you get into postseason once, you get into it again, and you just start to kind of build off of that. Was game six against Atlanta in 99 as an excruciating a baseball game as you ever played? Um, for my recollection, I, for me, like I say, being in 99, being a call up, I don't think there wasn't a lot of pressure or stress on me, but just being in that yeah. atmosphere and, and soaking that all in, you try to soak in as much of it as you can when you're there. Because well, number one, you don't know how long you're going to stay, but <laughs> you, you want to do your best and stick around and you want to just take in all the experience and, and move forward with it and do the best you can. And that game in 99, Mike Piazza hits a huge home run. The Mets were down five runs early. The Mets take the lead a couple of times late, didn't hold it. Braves wound up winning the pennant. But as an impressionable kid, uh, not even with a full big league season under your belt, to see Mike Piazza and how special he was perform under those kinds of circumstances, how influential was that on you, not only as a, a player, but just as someone who was around him every day? Um, it, it's big, really. I mean, you just, he, he kind of, you watch the way he goes about his work and about his business. There's never a moment where he's too high or too low. You know, he just was kind of steady, but he was always great. And in the big moments, he was even better. And that's something I think maybe I could learn from with that. You know, you could be 0 for 3. And I think even Bobby said that Jake could go up, strike out three times in a row. And that fourth time, he feels like he's going to get a big hit and win a game. And I think just stuff like that helped me realize, hey, it's, you, pitch to pitch, you know, at bat to bat, game to game, and you just have to learn to kind of stay steady because it's a, it's a long season. And then came 2000 when you guys finally won the National League pennant. And, uh, you know, I know we were talking about this a little bit before we started this interview, but uh, there was a little bit of a scary situation there in the bottom of the eighth inning. You had the game under control against the Cardinals, three outs away from the pennant, and then you got clocked, right, like coconut. Mm -hmm. um, did you see your impending World Series performance flash before your eyes on that? Did you feel hurt for a minute, like you might be in trouble? No, I just, I was more angry more than anything. Mm -hmm. And I think anytime you get in a hit, hit in the face, whether it's intentional or unintentional, your, your first thought is just your adrenaline kind of kicks in. And, you know, for me, it was, I was able to calm myself. Cause like I said, we, we were going to get to continue playing they were, they were going home, so you just you try to calm yourself. Bobby ended up, I think, taking me out of the game. I didn't get tossed or thrown out of the game or anything, but he just took me out, you know, because just to think, calm my tempers and make sure nothing got out of control. Did you think for even a split second, even though you got the game under control, you're about to win the pennant, but emotions in the heat of the moment being what they are, did you think for a minute, I'm going out to the mound to get that guy? Because, I mean, I remember the rage in your eyes. Yeah. Did you think that was about to escalate, and how did you stop yourself from making that happen? Um, no, like I said, I mean, first you get hit and it's instant. The adrenaline kicks in. I didn't think I was hurt too bad. 
but uh, you know, you get angry. But like I said, I think in my mind was like, hey, we're about to go to the World Series, so just let's not make this a big deal. We end up getting a big fight, and you know, guys get suspended. Who knows what happened? So I was able to at least gather myself in that moment. Was the worst of it being taken out and not being because it was fly ball to center yeah. that ended it, which I, Timo Perez look, caught. Yeah, I look back on that, and I think that was probably for me as like, man, I could have at least <laughs> caught that last out. Timo ended up getting it, but uh, you know, that's all right. We were like I say, we were going to the World Series. I knew I was going to be back out there playing. So. Everybody's got their own style. Timo yeah. jumped into the air before he made the catch. And he pulled it off. Yeah, we call that the Shinjo, because Tiyoshi Shinjo used to do that. He would be in the outfield, and we'd always watch him catch the fly ball. He'd jump up in the air and catch the fly ball. It was kind of funny. So he, he did a little Tiyoshi Shinjo right there. Was he as stylish, Shinjo, as anybody you played with? Oh, yeah, he was GQ. He was GQ all the way around. On the field, off the field, he was GQ. Did you give him the business for that? And did... uh, I didn't. He couldn't understand what I was, I was saying <laughs> anyway. It wouldn't matter. <laughs> but did you guys understand him at all? Uh, a little bit. He could communicate. The longer he was around, he could kind of get his point across. But he always had his translator with him, so that helped for sure. Well, that outfield we alluded to a moment ago. Timo catches the final out in Game 5 against the Cardinals. Benny Ogbayani's in that outfield, and up until that bottom of the eighth inning, you're part of that outfield, too. Um, I don't know that even if you asked most pretty good, long-standing Met fans to quickly name the starting outfield for the 2000 National League champions, that they'd necessarily come up with Agbayani, Agbayani Perez, and Peyton. Do you think about those guys much, given what you accomplished together? Um, yeah, that's what I said. I mean, you can sit in the dugout. You, you look at the lineups, and you, you look at the Yankees, and it's like, okay, they're supposed to be there. You look across at us, and, you know, we ended up getting Mike Bordick in a trade to play shortstop because mm -hmm. Ray was hurt. And you look at our team on paper, it wasn't, it wasn't the World Series type of team, but, you know, through perseverance and just everybody giving it their all and Bobby, Bobby getting the most out of everybody, we were able to end up in the World Series. How much did the first game kill your chances, do you think? Um, that was big. You know, Todd hit that, that ball that Timo thought was a home run. He didn't run. He's kind of jumping up and down, mm -hmm. going around the bases, and it hits the top of the wall, and then Jeter makes that great play and, and throws him out at the plate. And, you know, if he runs that ball, or if that ball goes out or anything, you know, that could completely change that series because they're all one-run games, I believe. There might have been one two-run game, but they were all one-run games, so that was huge. And then you hit the home run. It was You were down, I think, six runs in game two. Mm -hmm. And by the time you finished hitting the home run, that was a one-run game. Yep. Do you still carry that memory around you quite a bit, the home run off of Mariano? I know we talked about it a little bit at the beginning, but World Series home run, Yankee Stadium, the atmosphere being what it is. Do you dwell on that much? Um, I mean, it's, like I say, for me, that's one of the greatest moments for me to remember. I mean, Mariano's first ballot Hall of Famer, unanimous guy going into the Hall of Fame. So you look back at your career and some of the things you did. and I mean, that was a World Series. Never got back to World Series after that. Got to the playoffs again in 06 with Oakland. But, I mean, that, to, to have that happen in your, your first full season, considered your rookie season, that's pretty big, pretty big memory for me, pretty special yeah. moment. And before we let you go, we've got to reflect a little bit on what happened the next year in September of 2001, which we all experienced here in New York on September 11th. But 10 days later, the first game back at Shea Stadium, a lot of pomp and circumstance, a lot of trepidation, I'm sure. There are a lot of people a little nervous at that time about being in a setting with 45, 50,000 others. But somehow, amidst all that pomp and circumstance, you got a great big hug and kiss, as I recall, from Liza Minnelli. You guys still in touch? Uh, yeah, we don't keep in touch. But my mom actually, my mom printed a picture out from when I was going up to give her a hug for that and sent it off to her. And I think for my 40th birthday, she, Eliza signed it and, and sent it back. So I do, I do have that memory from that as well. Do you remember just how emotional that night was? That was, that was tough. I think there was a lot of tears. And I know there was a lot of controversy about even playing the game and mm -hmm. whatnot. But I think... You know, that, that's the great thing about sports is how it just kind of unites everybody. And I, I, in hindsight, that was probably one of the best things we could have did, you know, playing that game at night. And then for it to end the way it did with Mike hitting the, mm -hmm. the big home run in the eighth inning to, to give us the lead. I mean, it, it couldn't have played out any better considering the circumstances. And uh, this year, of course, we've been so blessed to have Jay Harwitz really step up the Mets initiative with all the alumni, which makes it such a treat to welcome people like Jay Payton back. Jay, it's been great to see you. Thanks, Thanks for I coming by. It. Thanks for having me. Jay Payton, our guest on One on One. I'm Howie Rose. We'll see you next time.